Now I think uh, I would like to request my colleague, Radhika, to uh, share her thoughts. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry. Great, wow. Now, <laughs> now I'd like to, because I have to speak to the, uh, I guess, you know, the microphone because we're recording it. So I'm requesting now Radhika to share her thoughts, maybe for about 10 minutes. Performance like this, uh, you're bound to uh, you know have questions, and you're bound to have many ways to look at it, uh, and you, it can go in all kinds of you know interesting uh, and exciting directions. Uh, but unfortunately, we have this place uh, only up to seven o'clock, so we'll try to end around seven o'clock. So, uh, my apologies to uh, Ashmina that we can't you know carry on this conversation for a long time. So, about ten minutes for Radhika, and then you know we'll see what Ashmina if she wants to respond or add something to that. And then also will allow at least one or two rounds of uh, comments or thoughts from you guys, including any questions you might ha have for uh, Ashmina. Thank you, Ashok, and thank you very much, Ashmina, for this for this experience, which is as much uh, performance as it is an experience. Uh, rather aptly, I have some notes written on the back of a boarding pass, which seemed. Uh, kind of appropriate to the, to the topics or the, the kind of themes raised by your work, because one of the first things that I thought of as you began in this very disembodied way, um, so that our experience of you was um, from the elevator, was how much of migration or the migrant life or, or movement and mobility at large is spent in the act of waiting and that most of our experience of movement, um, whether you're moving as a, as a migrant or whether you're moving as a tourist and traveler, is really, and perhaps even more so of late, is just simply spent in the act of waiting for something to happen. So the fact that you started our experience in this act of waiting, even though we had this, this, ex this sort of sense of you from the, um, from the camera work and the image here, we were really waiting for you to come. And you were curiously as well waiting in a, in a whole series of instances and incidents that happened outside. Um, and and that, was a, you know, that was a kind of a, a, a very revealing experience because it was reminding me that um, not only do we wait a lot, we wait a lot in institutional spaces. And institutional spaces have a, have a kind of we think they're neutral, but they have a sort of opacity to them, and they, are, um, they have built into them forms of exclusionary um, kind of structures in their design, so their doors close, people walk with purpose, and that when you're there walking seemingly without a sense of how to navigate it, even though we think them to be transparent, your um, displacement becomes very visible to us as, as people who are watching. So, um, you know, that was one of the things that I thought incredibly interesting in thinking about uh, the experience of sort of mobility and, and movement. And then a couple of other things that, um, that I'll, I'll remark on, ma mainly to see if, you know, they have any resonance with you. Um, one is the, so there's sort of three. One is containment and the, and the fact that both your sort of psychic vulnerability that you manifest in this performance, as well as the, in a sense, the geopolitical vulnerabilities, so the grand ones and the very little ones, if you will, or the very personal and intimate ones and the big ones with, with which actually Ashok began, the idea of remittance and how things move and how money moves across borders, which are at the macro level, and then you embodying that at the micro level. Um, is very much about what gets contained and what is uncontained. And that, that, um, that kind of flip-flop between borders and the anxieties of containment, the um, anxieties of an individual kind of wishing to contain and thereby maintaining some sense of self in this, in this movement. So your, your multiple layerings of shawls and sheets and bed sheets, you know, that they happen more than once and they more and more of them layer, you know, was it was a kind of idea of how does one um, how does one contain oneself in a, in a space? The um, the tape is more obvious to me, but the shawl is is a kind of way in which one closes oneself off 
and, and actually inhabits for a long, long time the peripheries of this room, right? So that it's there, you, you've entered, and at some point the bright lights went on, so we were like, you're in the institution as well, but you spend a, uh, you spent a great deal of time inhabiting the peripheries of the space, the edges of it before, and if at all, I, I don't know that we ever came to the center, except in the creation of a center amongst those of us who I, I think got married right today, um, those of us who created a kind of, of, a, of a circle, but another kind of, who created another kind of containment, um, voluntary, chosen, whatever, but who created that. So that was another thing that struck me. And the other, um, is indeed the disembodiment. Um, you know, before I knew what you were going to do, one of the questions that I was thinking, um, having seen some of your work on YouTube and reading a little bit of your background, was, the, was actually trying to think of the place of performance um, and the trajectories of performance art in this country and the very, very different trajectories of performance in South Asia, where um, Solo performers inhabit very different um, vocabularies and forms and come to it with different forms of training. And I was going to ask you at that point where you saw your work fit and in, in what conversation you see yourself and um, into what discourse you see yourself fitting in, in the context of art. But, but here I was actually more struck by the, the play between the, the presence and the disembodied self, um, partly as, a, as a, almost a kind of metaphoric space in which most of us encounter mobility and movement in the sense of virtuality, that we, we see people across great distances, across Skypes and Facebooks and other forms of technology, and that that has facilitated a type of belief that you know what's happening there. So we all think we know what's happening there by the elevator, um, and we have a sense of access. At the same time, it is, um, We've actually no idea what's happening to that woman with her bag, right? Mm -hmm. But so that mixture, you think one thinks of performance as very much an embodiment. I mean, that performance is about the presence of a body in space, and that's one of its power. So the, the ability to play with both the presence of the body in space here yeah. and the disembodied presence there to which we have access here. At the same time, also, once you come into the space, you know, it was probably a fair game, which of us chose, and we probably varied, uh, when we chose to look at that, even though you were here, and when we chose to look at you and not. It, it sets up a kind of confusion where we begin to get used to these mediated. And so, you know, in, in, in sort of very simple-minded kind of one-to-one -one terms, I think about um, migrants or immigrants and the fact that ones, they may exist on, for example, this island together with us, but they often exist exactly there, right? Through the televisions or the newspapers, through the mediatized ways, and not necessarily through the guy at Mappy who serves me coffee, who indeed inhabits that migrant. Mappy is our local coffee shop, um, which has had a very complex uh, relationship to migrant labor and, and people who leave and are unable to come back. But I think about the, the physicality of presence and, and how you, one encounters them and how that's very quickly displaced onto a sense of 40% of New Yorkers were born in all kinds of like statistics and, um, and mediated ways of, you know, of, of dealing with people that then make them kind of disembodied even though they're present. So I hope that's a way of opening up a conversation with all of you, and of course with you, Ashmina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think um, um, that uh, presence and absence is one of the most important thing, I think, for this performance in a way. Uh, um, I mean, in a way, like, I'm doing the research on diaspora at the moment, and I've, I've been a Nepali diaspora, basically. And also, I mean, this is uh, the age where everyone is moving one way or another. There is no question. I mean, it's not only about outside of the country, but within the country as well. And once you move out from your country or your place or your home, then you go to 
other place. And no matter how familiar, how, uh, I mean, you became, trying to become native, you never became that. So you always became the other. And also, after like long movement, if you go back home, then there also you became the other. So in that sense, it's kind of that space, third space, what Homi Baba is called. It's most of that. And I was really looking at how uh, like, um, the create home or the create that space. That is presence and absence. It's like psychologically, maybe it is presence, but physically it is not. And physically is it present, but psychologically not. So really, I'm really interested in that liminal space in the sense, where is that third space, which is, um, it's there, it's not there. You always it conflicting like in that space. And somehow, and also, at the moment, like, I mean, as I was researching how people, like, move, and it's very obvious in the performance, like, how you create, as you stated, like, you know, it's either forcefully or, like, voluntarily or, like, well, I mean, uh, the way uh, people kind of came in, like, how it is uh, forcefully or voluntarily, how it is, came in. that kind of community, how it create, and again, there is like that space. Yes, it is. No, it is not. And then I, I think that's very interesting aspect for me. And the way you stated, I think it's, uh, I, I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, if there is any other thoughts and then we can like bring. I mean, I actually I actually thought you were moving somewhere that was, quite, in, in some senses, different from Homi Bhabha's third space as a space of sort of the hybrid or a space of power, etc. That what you introduced into this was a much more everyday and thoroughly banal experience, which is just waiting. It isn't the space of advocacy. It isn't a space of power. It isn't the new hybrid. It's none of those things. It's just a kind of marking time. Yeah. Um, you know, um, Marc Auger, um, anthropologist, often calls airports and superhighways what he calls yeah. non-places, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's one way of thinking about it, but, um, but it's uh, the experience of those places, which is, which is different from what they are. That is the experience of being there and how we use them. I mean, the, the whole encounter with the toothbrush that you, and I think of, you know, you th I mean, most of us, I hope, don't really watch anybody else brush their teeth unless you live with them and you're very intimate yeah. with them. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, you land at an airport and you go into the airport bathroom and suddenly you're deep in, you know, every form of very personal morning ablutions, right? That, are, you know, every sound that you're in the middle of. And it's it's sudden encounter with a strange intimate bubble into which somebody is waking themselves. So you have, a, you have this kind of access because we are all together in, yes, liminal, but yes, in this kind of suspended space. And yeah. that's the piece that struck me as, you know, kind of different and interesting, and, and in that sense, quite different from the Homi Baba type of, th or the ideas of third space yeah. that allow one to say, oh, we are, we are hybrid, we have, the possibility of a of a different um, interaction with the with the here and now. This is sort of like a nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, and that makes it interesting, yeah. and and to me, still ambivalent. Yeah, I mean, this is. I mean, I think this is definitely ambivalent, and also it is kind of really the process that evolving, and then it's kind of really. Uh, uh, being in transition, that's how I see more like that. And that transition itself is whether we call it third space or not. I mean, I mean whether we bring Homi Baba or not, that's different. But it's kind of that, that experience of that in-betweenness. It's kind of nowhere, but at the same time, you are somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, I'm not really, sh I mean, I don't know, I mean, I. For me, that is also like the experience of how we, when we move, how we move, 
and that experience, I think. And also, like, um, the virtual and the uh, kind of uh, being present here and that kind of giving you distance, and that is actually what is happening now. Like, every day we kind of Skype or kind of, it is, you know what is happening, but at the same time, that sense of not knowing exactly what is happening. And that is, again, like, you are there and not there. It's more like that. Any yeah. comments or questions? Yeah, please. Yes. Yeah, let me. Oh. We have to speak. Yeah. I'm sorry, this room doesn't. Probably really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was very interested in what you did. Uh, t tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock at the Hoboken train station, people like you will be there. We'll be sitting in the waiting room at 5 when the station opens. And then about 7, people, of uh, thousands of people come in from western New Jersey and run through the station but pass us. We, they don't pay any attention to us in the waiting room. Most of the people in the waiting room are homeless or in some way traveling through. And uh, the people who are, have a purpose run to either the boats or they go to the path or they walk uh, to perhaps a job in, in Hoboken. And that sense of otherness where we literally are sitting there in the waiting room, and there is no one else there but people who are going nowhere, nowhere at all. And there's a couple of things that, for me, were uh, unusual. First of all, the deference that the audience paid to you, that, that's not usually the way it is. We're, we know each other, but we're very careful. We, we don't intrude or move close to you or, you know, there's usually there, I don't know if you've ever been in the train station, and it's been repaired since Sandy, but there are huge benches. Each person gets, he's here, and I'm here, and there's space in between us, but we don't intrude on his space. And then the other thing is the desire to have your own space, which I saw with the, uh, your tape. That is an unbelievable need to have something that belongs to you, even if it's the bathroom, the biffy, the... the outdoor toilet where you can lock yourself in at night. Um, and the other thing, of course, is your possessions. And the care and the absolute, um, or I don't know what the word is, uh, danger you feel that someone will get your stuff somehow, your bag or, you know, that someone will take that. And the things that you have with you, those shaws, for me represented a sense of, of the past and something that was important and something that tied you to your reality, you know, your, your security. That's how I, anyway, I found it very, very moving. And uh, if you're not busy some morning at 6, come on over to Hoboken and you'll see an amazing replication of some of the things you did. The one thing you did that we is absolute no-no. You left your stuff. We don't, we don't leave our stuff. We take it, we put it in the trash or we whatever, but we don't leave it, you know. We don't like to, it's sort of a respectful kind of thing. But the audience, you, you people were wonderful to her, but um, that's not the general experience you have. But they're, we're, they're not mean, we're not mean. We don't push, but w w w people running through the station don't see us, and then the other people who do are people like us, and they don't, that we, you know, we, we sometimes sleep in the shelter. Five o'clock, we get out, have to move out of the shelter. But uh, so we know each other, but we don't interact in an intimate way like that. So anyway, it's sort of personal, sorry. Thank you. But I found it very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, well, I think that you might not recognize that she had a choice as to who she could um, create a community with. And by, uh, so in fact, she had an active role in sensing who might be sensitive to her plight. And I think that even in Hoboken, in a train station, 
not everyone will be um, completely impersonal, um, but that each individual can possibly sense there's a nice or kind, empathetic, um, sensitive person or persons who will help out in some way, whether it just providing um, empathy or allowing um, her to be a part of uh, your space and then um, create an inclusive community. So I, I think that you're possibly not giving humanity a little bit of a shot at, you know, you know, people will actually help out. I would have done a number of things yet to be a topic. Did you not get a chance to have I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, she actually did, you know, she moved you. I was excluded. She, but did the taping first before. Yeah. So there was a there was a precursor. So if you got up, I suppose, and moved out of that tape, yeah. then you might not get invited into the chocolate. One of the one of the things I noticed was that uh, when she uh, moved around, if you notice, uh, she went close. She wherever she went, she went close to persons, whoever they were. Every one of them shrugged off when she moved closer to them. You moved. You moved. You moved. The person moved, you moved, you moved. She was, he was forced to move because she was cutting up. But I think this, is, this kind of represents that a uh, lot of the Im uh, immigrants are struggled off, up, up front, you know, to, without really knowing who they are, what they, what they are capable of. They are just uh, struggled off, up front. And uh, as time passes, as they understand, they realize, then they slowly become part of the community, part of the uh, larger society. I think that that is my sort of feeling. And I think that's, that's pretty much true no matter where you go. In the immigrant community, in the beginning, nobody wants to you know, accept it so easily. And it changes as time passes. Thank you. Um, no, so certainly it was a very, very powerful message. Uh, one, uh, in one word which I could describe the whole thing is uncertainty. Actually, when you, uh, my, my migration and the whole uh, depiction of the whole thing uh, uh, displayed uh, throughout today was in every step of the way, it was you are uncertain about what next is going to happen. Because uh, uh, that, uh, to me, is the, the biggest uh, you know, factor in, in our daily lives. Uh, the moment you have an uncertainty as to what uh, is expected next, when you don't know what is to be expected, that is the biggest fear that you have. That is the biggest uh, you know, um, uh, not knowing how to move around. So uh, this was throughout the... Um, exhibit, it was displayed from uh, moving to the corners, from coming all the way uh, from the staircase, and uh, how the other person would react. And one thing, because it was completely uh, a display uh, as an exhibit, uh, if you, in, the, in the real life, uh, you will have a lot of uh, verbal abuses by passers-by. Uh, in some other corners, you may be just uh, you know, chucked out of the place. Those kind of you know uh, incidences will also occur, but in, in, because it is uh, a familiar ground for all of us, and we know uh, our dear colleague here, uh, we were just kind of you know uh, only watching uh, uh, with uh, great interest. But in a in a, in a natural setting, certainly uh, in, in, there will be some resistance uh, at at various points. Uh, um, uh, you know, when you offered your uh, uh, warmth and you when you offered your friendship in various points, uh, you did not get any of those, uh, you know, um, uh, resistance. But uh, in the real life, certainly you will have that. Uh, sometimes you'll be kicked around, you'll be just, uh, you know, given some sort of a, 
uh, abusive language or something, uh, you know, to, to, to go out of this place or something like that. But uh, here, uh, so to me, the, the entire uh, thing uh, is uh, well displayed in terms of uncertainty as to what uh, that's the best uh, ex expression that I could make on this uh, whole uh, exercise. And this was a great performance. Thank you. I was also, I just found the whole thing very insightful. And one of the things that it, it uh, reminded me of, you know, when I'm living in New York and the United States, I feel very much totally in control of almost everything all the time. And one of the few times that, that this reminded me of was when I was traveling in um, Taiwan and I was on my own and I could not understand the language and I could not read even the characters. And then I felt completely like um, in kindergarten almost, almost like a child, because I could not, and I felt that felt very out of control. And I, I sometimes during that uh, period of time, I felt the need to sort of hunker down just to get more, just a sense of, I don't know whether it was control or just a sense of security. But it reminded me of that, and that was many years ago. So it was quite interesting. Thank you. Yeah, just about moving in unfamiliar spaces and the, the, the thing that, Ashmina, you were doing about wrapping yourself in the shawls. And uh, I think that it is about, it's about containment, but also and a kind of protection and, and keeping yourself together. Because I find um, sometimes when we're moving in unfamiliar spaces and very uncertain spaces, we will um, kind of be on all the time and have all of our senses heightened. And uh, after a while, this comes to be something overwhelming. And so then we want to do that kind of wrapping ourselves in a shawl. And then um, when you uh, created the community of friends, then you also, um, you referenced being married. So that's one way that you can see it. But it, I think it was also like finding the people who you can also um, relax with and have a, have a respite, a space of, of obeyance from being um, totally sensorially um, attuned to everything all the time. So that's one way of thinking about it. Yeah, and it was really emotional and beautiful, so thank you. <laughs> Um, I think long ago when I did one performance in New School itself, after the performance, some people asked me what, what you were doing, what it does mean. And then I just said, well, it's like, at that time I felt like I, I answered that time, I, I think I said, Oh, it's like a poet reads or uh, recites his poem, and then people ask, and then poet don't know what to say. <laughs> but it is not that condition. I mean, it's I mean, it's really how everyone's experience and how everyone really took that. It's really great, and um, I think like as an artist and like I when I create when I am in this space when I'm creating I'm in unfamiliar space too and I think that challenge because if uh, there would be other I mean more people or uh, like different environment, the performance, the essence, and things would definitely change with uh, different. I mean, but several things would be same, but at the same time, how you re react, and when you are performing, you're being there, and also the audience, or uh, like how it react, it's really important, and it it gives more life in its sense. So I, I think uh, it is really um, 
um, that experience. And every time I try to perform or I try to create any work, I go to that unfamiliar zone, which is almost like migrating from one creating part to another creating part. And this is also a journey for me, uh, for my personal growth or however we take it. And I guess it's, I mean, we go through, I mean, all of us go through that experience. And I'm really thankful to Ashok, you, 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 you all. <laughs> And uh, it's been really wonderful. And it definitely um, gives me to look forward and go forward and create more on the things in life. Can you tell us how you construct the work? What are the variables that are set? And what is open for? Like, how, is the, how, are you, how do you craft the performance? Usually. Uh, like, I work on my head a lot. Uh, and then uh, when, what, I mean, if I'm doing installation and other um, genre, I mean, it's very different. But when I'm performing, uh, sometimes I know, uh, like, I know how I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But the reaction and senses and how you like so many things really depends on the audience as well. It really depends. And there, there would be uh, several thing changes. Changes, that doesn't mean conceptually thing changes, but the reaction and it, it really, and, and that is really important. And that's why the, uh, I mean, I think the performance is so powerful because of that liveliness. So is, does what change is like temporality and duration, or do, do is there actually certain kinds of interaction? I mean, like what in are you? Do you have a series of things from which you might draw and leave, or how many pieces are in a sense set and their temporal their duration might change, but they're still there? Is what what? I'm trying to understand like how yeah. obviously some of this is site specific, right? You yeah. you elected to yeah. Do, but this could be done in different yeah, places. Yeah, sure. So how much of that is shifting, and how much of it is, in a sense, part of a performance that you know, um, the sequence that you know? Um, because before I do the performance, I come at least and see the space, so I know the space. And kind of I think through, like, OK, this might be the way I was move. I mean, I'll move or I'll do this or so. So I know quite a bit, but like the interaction and also duration really differs. It's very much. But at the same, the concept doesn't go beyond kind of thing. But it it stays in that. And um, I mean, if I mean, I I was not really sure how many people would be there. Like five people or ten people or. 100 people, it's really, and, and that might have been very different. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think we need to end, but uh, just to echo what uh, you know, Radhika said, uh, really, the, uh, I like the idea of experience, you know, that to describe this as you know, uh, uh, an experience that we all, you know, through her you know, uh, uh, initiation, uh, we experienced it. So I think I think that was you know quite you know beautiful and uh, powerful on many levels. Uh, I also liked you know the ambul ambivalence, uh, you know fluidity in some ways, because that's what the whole idea of you know migration is all about. So I think in, in that sense, you know, uh, I don't know whether other forms you know would capture you know this idea in in a way that you did, you know, through performance art. I, so I think that was quite. Mm, you know, uh, uh, amazing on uh, you know multiple levels. So, and the great thing about uh, what you do is you leave us with a lot more to think about. So I'm sure you know, uh, a couple of days later we'll think about some aspect that will you know help you see the same thing in a different way. Uh, and that's exactly what my you know migrant uh, you know uh, you know experience is all about. You know, because you know you, you are constantly going back and forth. You know, with things you know you experience. So so thank you again, uh, and thank you all for coming. So uh, do visit her website. She has a lot of those things. These you know uh, 
performances as well as her other you know types of you know work posted on the website so i think uh, you can certainly uh, stay engaged with uh, her work and stay engaged with uh, india china institute's work so thank you all thank you. bye bye thank you.